Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for Seeing the Future Without Limits, Successful Transition to Adulthood and Employment. My name is Wendy Vance. I am joined today by Carolina Trigo. We are both advocate investigators with Disability Rights Florida. Disability Rights Florida is the state's protection and advocacy agency. We have funding responsibility and authority under nine federal grant programs to protect the rights of Floridians with disabilities. We are a not-for-profit corporation since 1987. We have offices in Tallahassee, Tampa, Hollywood, and Gainesville. We have satellite offices in several other communities. We are able to provide services statewide and all services are free. Even if we don't have an office specifically in your location, we can still um, work with you. So, you know, if you have a disability related issue, we encourage you to give us a call um, and talk to one of our wonderful intake specialists. Our mission, Disability Rights Florida advocates, educates, investigates, and litigates to protect and advance the rights, dignity, equal opportunity, and self-determination and choices of all people with disabilities. We will cover current disability-related statistics, parent caregiver concerns, preparing for transition, WIOA, Life After High School, Self-Advocacy in College, and Is Employment Really Possible? Important acronyms that we will cover today include IEP, Individualized Education Plan, TIEP, Transition IEP Plan, VR, Vocational Rehabilitation, WIOA, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, IPE is an Individualized Plan for Employment. So now we're going to discuss a little bit about disability as it relates to numbers. Um, and help you to see the impact that disability has um, as it relates to education and employment and how those numbers fluctuate depending on what areas change. So how much education you have, that kind of thing, and how those numbers um, play out. The first thing that we want to cover today um, is the poverty guidelines. And yes, this chart is older. This is a poverty um, guideline that came to us um, from 2018. Um, and as you will notice on the very first line, it notes that households um, that are in this group, so it has one person in it, um, that it's considered to be poverty when you're at $12,100. Okay, so right now, um, the amount of money that someone can receive from the SSI program, so the Social Security Supplemental Income Program, which is what happens most often when you don't have a, um, a work record. This is where you usually receive from. Um, and that amount is $783 a month, which is $9,396 for the year. As you can see, uh, this amount is well below what is considered to be the poverty guidelines. So, and then I want you to take a moment 
and imagine that you had to live and pay all of your expenses, rent, food, lights, everything, on less than $12,000 a year, or even $12,000 a year. Would you be able to do it? And so this is something that we need to think about um, when it comes to our youth and young adults with disability and how to give them a more stable and um, financially prosperous future so that they can, in fact, enjoy a lot of the things that you and I um, have every day and to make sure that they have a sustainable income that can provide um, for their needs. Employment statistics. The statistics that we're sharing with you today are based on a normal job market, what it is when we are not involved in a global pandemic. So when there aren't other factors, um, you know, causing higher than normal unemployment. So that's the numbers that we're going to talk to you about today when we are in this normal um, sort of employment climate. So 32.6% of individuals with disabilities are working. 16% of individuals with developmental disabilities are working in the community. And so what makes the difference in that number in who's employed, who's not employed? How do we increase that number? One study in 1998 by Whitmer and Schwartz um, found that self-determination was a big factor in whether or not someone um, was employed. As a matter of fact, they found at that time that 80% of individuals who were highly self-determined were employed, and only 43% of those with low self-determination were working in paid positions at that time. So, you know, self-determination is making choices and having control over your own life, making that choice. Do I want to work? Where do I want to work? Um, rather than being told you're going to work here or we don't think that you can work or whatnot. Instead, that person has the opportunity to make their own choices and to have control over their life, have control over how their money is spent and the choices that they make, who they associate with. So when you're highly self-determined, when you have a lot of ability to make those choices and not have people making those choices for you, you're more likely to be employed. So, of course, you know, we encourage self-determination and control over your own life and making those own, your own um, choices and decisions um, for a number of reasons, but in part for work. Now, to break it down as far as inside of that 32% that are working, what do we find? Where do we find people, what industries? And so 20% of individuals with disabilities are working in the service industry. 14.1% of working individuals with disabilities are in production, transportation, and moving materials. And so now the unemployment rate for individuals with disabilities is 9.2%. Now, you might ask, if 32% are working, how is it that only 9.2% um, you know, are considered to be unemployed? That is because only, really, you, you have 8 in 10 individuals with disabilities that are not in the work. So if you take 10 people, only two of those are going to be in the workforce, and the other eight are not going to be considered part of the workforce. So they're not really counted in that unemployment rate. And so, um, and if you compare that, like I said, in normal circumstances, three in 10 individuals without disabilities are not in the workforce. So you have a lot more people without disabilities who are taking part in the workforce and to be counted in the 
workforce, so you would be counted as unemployed rather than not in the workforce, you have to be seeking employment. So in other words, you are out there looking for a job, you're actively seeking that. So when somebody with a disability is asked, you know, are you seeking employment? And they say no, that automatically puts them in the column of not in the workforce. So it doesn't count towards that unemployment rate. So sometimes that can get a little um, skewed, but there is a high unemployment rate, um, but there are a lot of factors that can change that. And that's what we wanna talk to you about today is how can we increase that number? Because employment really is possible. And we're gonna talk to you a um, about that throughout the day. Education statistics. Again, please remember that these numbers are based on a normal economy, not what we're facing now. Um, of course, you know, as data becomes available, we can change this information so we can see, you know, what is happening then. But for right now, this is information that is based on the 2018 um, Bureau of Labor and Statistics report. Um, so I'm going to compare this with individuals without disabilities so you can kind of see the difference, okay? Um, and so 11.1% of people with disability have less than a high school diploma, and of that group, 9.8% um, are employed. Compared to 57% of individuals without a disability have less than a high school diploma, and of that group, 54% are employed. 16.9% of people with a disability have a high school diploma, and of that group, 15.6% are employed. Compared to individuals without a disability, 65.6% have a high school diploma, and 63% of that group are employed. 23.4% of people with a disability have some college or an associate degree, and 21.8% um, of that group are employed, compared to 71.9% um, of individuals without a disability who have some college or um, an associate's degree. 69.7% of that group is employed. 29.8% of individuals with a disability have an undergraduate degree, and of that group, 28.5% of individuals with a disability who have a college degree are working, compared to 71, 77.1, excuse me, of people without a disability have completed an undergraduate degree, and of that group, 75.5% of individuals without a disability um, are employed. So, I say all that to say this, you can see that as your education increases, your um, employment increases. So there are factors that can happen that can increase or lower your chances of being employed. And also not only being employed, but where you are employed. So as your education increases, the likelihood of your employment increases, you can see the pattern playing out in both people with disabilities and um, people without disabilities. You know, as you have more education, your likelihood of employment increases. So that is some food for thought uh, and keep that in mind for later as we continue to, um, to discuss this topic with you. Hello, my name is Carolina Trigo, and I am an advocate at Disability Rights Florida, and I am co-presenting with my colleague, Wendy Vance. I will begin the portion of the PowerPoint that discusses parental concerns about adulthood. In this slide, I will be discussing benefits as it relates to transition. Within the first bullet point, I will discuss Social Security as it relates to work incentives. Under the Social Security Administration, there is a program called the Ticket to Work program, which helps with work incentives. Work incentives make it easier for people with disabilities to work and still receive medical benefits and in some cases, cash benefits from Social Security. Work incentives can help you through the transition to work and financial independence. Work incentives and the Ticket to Work program make it possible for you to explore work while still receiving benefits. They are designed to help you succeed. 
You may be able to keep your Medicaid and or Medicare while you work. You have access to individualized support services and you can try work with confidence knowing you may be able to keep some or all of your benefits during your transition period. Social Security has many work incentives designed to fit your individual situation. Here are some examples that I will provide of work incentives that you may be available that may be available to you. The first one, trial work period, which is for SSDI recipients only, allows you to test your ability to work for at least nine months. During your test trial work period, you will receive full SSDI benefits no matter how much you earn as long as your work activity is reported and you have a disabling impairment. Second example would be the expedited reinstatement, which is available to SSDI and SSI recipients. If your benefits stopped because of your earnings levels and you are no longer able to work because of your medical condition or one related to, to it, you can request to have your benefits reinstated without having, a, having to complete a new application. While Social Security determines your benefits reinstatement, you are eligible to receive temporary benefits for up to six months. The last example I will be discussing will be protection for medical continuing disability reviews, which is available to SSDI and SSI recipients. If you assign your ticket to an approved service provider before you receive notice of a medical continuing disability review, you will not have to undergo the medical review while you are participating in the Ticket to Work program and making progress within Social Security's time frame. The second bullet point I will be discussing is Medicare and how it relates to extended eligibility. The extended period of Medicare coverage provision allows for beneficiaries who meet the Social Security Disability Standard to continue Medicare's coverage for at least 93 months after the trial work period ends, even if cash benefits ceased due to substantial gainful activity level of employment. The last bullet point I will be discussing for benefits is Medicaid. 32 states within the United States, including the state of Florida, <clears throat> provide Medicaid eligibility to people eligible for supplemental security income benefits. In these states, the SSI application is also the Medicaid application. application. Medicaid eligibility starts the same months as SSI eligibility. The concerning question here is what happens to Medicaid coverage if a SSI recipient works? If a recipient's state provides Medicaid to people of, on SSI, the recipient will continue to be eligible for Medicaid. Medicaid coverage can continue even if a recipient's earnings along with other income become too high for a SSI cash payment. You can refer to more information on the general work incentive section within the SSA.gov homepage. In this slide, I will be discussing Health with Benefits Planning and Financial Independence. The Division of Vocational Rehabilitation and the Division of Blind Services can make this referral in order to assist with work incentive planning and assistance. They have certified counselors that are trained and also certified by Social Security Administration that can help understand the impact of work and finding out which work incentive you can use and best fits. Another organiza organization, Disability Rights Florida, assists in the protection and advocacy for beneficiaries of Social Security. They can offer guidance and assistance with overpayments. The last bullet point, special needs trusts and other disability accounts. We advise that you contribute now to assist with future expenses. Savings do not affect benefits up to 100,000 and family can contribute. Money can be used for a wide range of reasons, such as education, housing, transportation, employment training, and support, assistive technology, and related services. It can also be utilized for health prevention and wellness, financial management, and administrative services, which include legal fees, funeral and burial, and basic living expenses. In this slide, I will be discussing transportation. The Agency for Persons with Disabilities, Division of Blind Services, and DVR can assist with transportation needs. The next bullet, fixed route. Fixed route can be offered through most public transportations, which is 
services provided on a repetitive fixed schedule basis along a specific route with vehicles stopping to pick up and deliver passengers to specific locations. Each fixed route trip serves the same origins and desti desti destinations such as rail and bus, unlike demand responsive and van pool services. The following bullet point discusses paratransit, which is types of passenger transportation which are more flexible than conventional fixed route transit but more structured than the use of private automobiles. Paratransit includes demand responses, demand response transportation services, shared ride taxis, carpooling and van pooling, and jitney services. Emergency ride home most often refers to wheelchair accessible demand response services. Can also refer to backup transportation for qualifying emergencies, such as illness or unscheduled overtime used up to four times per year. You must register with FDOT, Florida Department of Transportation. The next bullet point mentions taxi, which would be your local common taxi um, that you can contact that varies on the area of the telephone number that that would be assigned. Um, the last bullet point, which is shared ride, I gave the examples of Uber and Lyft. A shared ride program as defined by dictionary.com as a car service with which a person can use a smartphone app to arrange a ride in a usually privately owned vehicle. Now with share ride on Uber or Lyft, you have the option of carpooling when you do request a service through the smartphone app, or you can request that it would be a ride where it would where you would be only the passenger. The next slide that I will be addressing discusses parental concerns regarding integrated work settings. Three of the bullet points that I've highlighted. First one, concerns about safety in the workplace. The second one, concerns about fitting in or and or belonging. Last one, concern that their child cannot work in an integrated setting. In regards to these concerns, I do like to begin by addressing that segregated work creates opportunity for abuse, neglect, and exploitation. There is little government oversight or review is conducted for sheltered workshops. In the competitive workplace, workers have protections through a variety of labor laws, which also provide for accommodations, allowing the workers to be more productive. Segregated work breeds isolation, often located in remote rural locations with limited access to transportation and limited opportunities to utilize social skills. Studies have shown that this isolation leads to a reduction in social skills and self-esteem. Another issue regarding sheltered employment, which interchangeably I am referring to as segregated employment, parents are often informed by trusted school staff and other service providers that their child is not capable of competitive employment. Therefore, they believe that this is true without further investigation. This creates what is known as the school to sheltered work pipeline. In this slide, I will be discussing how you can prepare for transition while still in high school. Where to begin? First and foremost, know your IEP. Does it have a transition plan? Does your IEP have supports and services to help you achieve your transition plan? It is important to note that you can begin discussing and exploring this as early as the age of 14 with your IEP team. It is equally important to also begin planning and discussing as soon as possible potential career interests, goals, general interests, and a general plan or want post-secondary. The school is obligated under WIOA to make the referral to vocational rehabilitation, and this can occur as early as 14. The second bullet point discusses diploma options. Under the standard diploma, a student with or without disabilities can receive either a merit or a scholar diploma. This differs depending on the extra or varied classes that are taken during high school. In essence, and the most important thing to keep in mind is that there is no more a special diploma. All students, regardless 
of receiving ESC services or within the general education <laughs> curriculum work towards the same standard diploma in Florida. Lastly, the last bullet point I will be discussing is deferred standard diploma. Who can defer receipt of their standard diploma? Only a student whose IEP requires special education, transition planning, transition services, or related services through the age of 21 may defer receipt up of the standard diploma. This decision needs to be made and discussed by the IEP team on or before May 15th of the year that the student is expected to graduate. The next slide I will be discussing is the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. The Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, also known as WIOA, is a United States public law that replaced the previous Workforce Investment Act of 1998 as the primary federal workforce development legislation to bring about increased coordination among federal workforce development and related programs. The VR sections of WIOA are in effect. Key provisions of the Title IV Vocational Rehabilitation Program. WIOA makes significant changes to programs authorized under the Rehabilitation Act of 73, Title IV, particularly to the VR program. This is one of the core programs administered by the Department of Education providing VR services to individuals with disabilities, including students and youth with disabilities. The program's specific final rule adheres to the following key goals. One, aligns the VR program with other core programs. WIOA strengths, strengthens the alignment of the VR program with other core programs of the workforce development system. This alignment also brings together various entities and workforce educational and human resource programs to create a seamless customer focused service delivery network that integrates service delivery across programs, enhances access to services and improves long term employment outcomes for individuals with disabilities. Second, strengthens the VR programs focus on competitive integra integrated employment. The guiding principle of the VR program is the individual with disabilities, including those with the most significant disabilities, are capable of achieving high quality, competitive, integrated employment when provided the necessary services and supports. To increase the employment of the individuals with disabilities in the competitive, integrated labor market, the workforce system must provide individuals with disabilities opportunities to participate in job driven training and pursue high quality employment outcomes. The VR program enhances access to services, including VR services for individuals with disabilities seeking or continuing employment at sub-minimum wages and entities holding special wage certificates under Section 14C of the Fair Labor Standards Act, enabling them to achieve competitive integrated employment. Last one, expands VR services to students and youth with disabilities. WIOA ensures that students and youth with disabilities have meaningful opportunities to receive the VR services they need to achieve competitive and integrated employment. WIOA amends the VR program to expand not only the population of students with disabilities who may receive VR services, but also the breadth of services that the VR agencies may provide to youth and students with disabilities who are transitioning from school to post-secondary education and employment. Under WIOA, the VR program strengthens coordination between VR agencies and local education agencies in the provision of transition services provided under the individual with disabilities education act and the provision of pre-employment transition services to students with disabilities under the VR program. Lastly, third bullet point, each VR office must also work with local schools and workforce development programs to ensure their appropriate involvement in transition related services. In this slide, I will be discussing transition IEP. It can begin as a, at age 14 or earlier if deemed appropriate. Results are oriented, focusing on academic and functional achievement, designated to facilitate movement from school to post-school activities, and also spells out all the students' unique educational needs, supports, and related services, which agencies or individuals will provide services, and who will pay for them. Program accommodations, modifications, and supports to help the student reach their goals, whether there is a need for technology or assistive device, and which agency will supply these. Transition planning can begin earlier if necessary. If you need to begin your transition plan early, for instance, 14, you can begin transition planning earlier than 16. Each transition plan should cover the youth's goals and all the support and services that the young person with a disability will need to prepare for the fullest possible life as an adult. The team should discuss how the student learns, how much they can learn, how they can provide what they've learned, and how they can use that information 
as adults. They also need adults to understand what skills they will need to live in the community and plan for how those skills will be acquired. If the education system, vocational rehabilitation agencies, and private and government social services can provide a service or support and the person covered by the plan needs it, the plan should show the way to get it. For instance, what is the student's desired post-school outcome? What type of work does the student want to do? And what type of training supports or services are needed to prepare the student for that work? What type of job training will the student need in the classroom, community, or both? Are any post-secondary accommodations needed? Are any evaluations needed to support requests for post-secondary accommodations? Are there any life skills the school any life skills a student has yet to learn? For instance, organization, communication, daily living, transportation, and socialization. These are all important questions to raise and pose to the team as you plan. In this slide, I will be discussing being involved in the process. It is one of the most important aspects in the transition planning. What does this mean for the student in question to attend their own IEP slash TIEP meetings? Participate in the IEP meeting from beginning to end. Be vocal about your wants and needs. Typically, the student receiving services under an IEP tends to not attend their own IEP meetings, and it usually tends to be the parents. However, when they reach of age of transition, it is key and it is recommended if the student wants to, of course, to participate in these meetings in order to vocalize their wants, needs, career aspirations, and planning post-secondary. Some goal examples that can be given and put and delineated on the transition IEP can be their want to go to college, want to live on campus, potentially drive themselves to college independently and graduate with a bachelor's degree. However, the list can go on. These are just a few examples. So what is vocational rehabilitation, often referred to as VR? Their mission is to help people with disabilities find and maintain employment and enhance their independence. They're available to provide support to high school students ages 14 through 21. VR can attend IEP meetings to help with the transition process. This is important to note. VR should participate throughout the transition planning process, not just when the student is nearing graduation. As mentioned in my previous slide, depending on when you wanna begin discussing transition as early as 14 or 16 or in between, it is important to note that VR, the student can begin receiving services from VR, VR and begin working simultaneously or in conjunction with the school in order to facilitate this transition planning process. Lastly, the Division of Blind Services, also known as DBS, provides similar array of employment supports and job placement assistance. Some of the things that you can do while in high school that will assist in the transition planning can involve, but are not limited to, medical and psychological assessments, vocational evaluation and planning, career counseling and guidance, work readiness training, and work experiences. These are assessments, trainings, and evaluations that can be done by VR simultaneously to any evaluations, assessments, or special trainings the schools can offer as well. So it is important to note before you leave high school, the federal law requires that if you are eligible, you must leave school with an approved DVR or DBS individualized plan for employment, which it can also be known as an IPE. With an IPE, you can begin receiving services from DVR or DBS, otherwise you may experience unnecessary delays. After exiting high school, workplace accommodations, job placement, job coaching, on-the-job training, supported employment, assistive technology and devices, time-limited time limited medical and or psychological treatment. These are all services that can still be provided even after you've exited high school. In this slide, I will be discussing transition services provided by DVR, also known as the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. Guidance and counseling, post-secondary training options, career counseling and guidance, work readiness training, work experiences, and self-advocacy training. In terms of career counseling, they can offer job exploration counseling, for instance, to get into more detail. Some work-based learning experiences may include 
in school or after school opportunities or experience outside the traditional school setting, including internships, provide an integrated environment to the maximum extent possible. There are also opportunities within your local community for the student to get involved that can help in the preparation of either the career of their interest or working on certain skills um, that can help them in the post-secondary transition period. There's also counseling on opportunities for enrollment in comprehensive transition or post-secondary educational programs at institutions of higher education. Workplace readiness training helps to develop social skills and independent living. Instruction and self-advocacy include through person-centered planning, which may include peer mentoring with people with disabilities who are working in competitive integrated environments. These are just some examples. IPE, known as an Individual Plan for Employment, I know I alluded to this in previous slides. What is it exactly? An Individual Plan for Employment is a blueprint for successful employment for a person who is a client of the Florida Division of Vocational Rehabilitation or the Division of Blind Services. It enables you to gain access to vocational services. Apply for and start working on your IPE before graduation. An IPE, in other words, it's very similar in certain aspects to kind of a blueprint that a transition IEP or an IEP would offer. It would delineate either the plan for a business model that you would want to create or a career option that you want to explore. So it kind of is very individualized to what your desires and what your plan is um, already after the post-secondary period. So if you can get started on this prior to graduation, that would be ideal. Ideal. In this slide, I will be discussing the general program and services that the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation offers. This can be workplace accommodations, job placement, job coaching, on-the-job training, supported employment, assistive technology and devices, time-limited time limited medical and or psychological treatment, vocational training, and post-secondary education. In this slide, I will go into a little bit more detail of how you can begin developing your IPE, also known as your individual plan for employment. The IPE should state your employment goal and the services you will need to achieve it. Should be a, it should be a very specific goal. Should list in detail the services that you are needed and who will pay for them. For example, will you require further education, transportation needs, mental health therapy, medical treatment, technology that you would need, etc. State responsibilities for the student, VR, and third-party agencies. In this slide, I will be discussing the Client Assistance Program. Disability Rights Florida, our organization, administers the CAP in a manner that empowers people with disabilities to fully understand and exercise their rights to services. It strives to assure that people with disabilities are allowed to make informed choices throughout the vocational rehabilitation and independent living process and are treated with dignity and respect. It can provide information on the services available, including the time frames for these services and explain the federal regulations and state rules. When there is a difference of opinion between the consumer and VR, CAP can directly involved to assist in resolving the, the disagreement. So what can the Client Assistance Program do, also known as CAP? It reviews case records and speaks with counselors, supervisors, community rehabilitation providers, and others involved in the VR case. It provides advocacy services to the client, helps to develop strategies to resolve disagreements through negotiation, represents clients at mediations or fair hearings, provides information on Title I of the American with Disabilities Act, also known as ADA, provides support and assistance to consumers so they may advocate for themselves. Lastly, it provides information and referral to other program and resources. How does CAP provide services to clients? CAP can address complaints regarding denied access to vocational rehabilitation services. For instance, CAP can participate in negotiation, representation at appeals, explanation of DVR, DBS policies, and rights and responsibilities of the client. CAP can also assist in obtaining a reasonable accommodation in the workplace. Lastly, CAP can address systematic issues to increase access to assistive technology and work safe modifications. In this slide, I will be discussing what is the agency 
for persons with disability, also known as APD, which I did refer to in one of my previous slides. So this serves individuals with developmental disabilities. What is considered a developmental disability? Severe autism, cerebral palsy, intellectual disabilities, Down syndrome, Prader-Willi, Fellow McDermott syndrome, spina bifida, children aged three to five at high risk for developmental disability. What is considered an intellectual disability? Typically involves having an IQ run on a full scale and either falling 70 or below in that IQ score. So what services does APD offer for these individuals? It can be social, medical, residential, behavioral, supported employment, and services are based on individual need. So it does offer a wide menu of services that can assist in many aspects of your life. Um, I also wanted to note that supported employment services may be provided to individuals who are on the wait list. So Carolina and I want to spend a little bit of time with you talking about what is life like after high school? What happens? Training. There are a variety of different ways to receive training um, after high school, although some of these you may have encountered even while in high school. As we said earlier, the more education you have, the more likely you are to be employed. However, we also realize that not everyone wants to go to college. Not everyone thrives in um, that kind of environment of lecture and projects and paper pencil work. Some people really do learn from experience, are hands on. That is how they learn. That is how they like to learn. Um, so there is an opportunity for you as well. There's something called on the job training. And that really is what it sounds like it is. You're on the job and you're learning the job. Hands on, you might have a job coach, that kind of thing. Now, you may have had some experience with this during your transition in high school. Um, so, you know, you may already have a little bit of experience of how this works, but typically in an adult setting, you're going to run into this through vocational rehabilitation or through the division of blind services. Blind services cause this um, work experience. It's the same thing. So on the job training basically is that blind services or vocational rehabilitation sets up a relationship uh, with an employer who then brings you on staff and you are paid, you know, minimum wage, but your pay ultimately comes from DR or DDS who then pays the employer. And you might stay on this experience two weeks. You might stay as much as six months. And most of the time the contracts are set up so that if the employer really likes you and you do a very good job, that they have the potential to hire you. So you could have the experience and then get hired. Now, in our current climate, it may not work like that. They may have a spot for you to come and train and do the job and you get the experience and it's something that you can put on your resume, but they realistically may not be able to hire you at you know this time. So, but I still think the experience is worth doing if that is the way that you learn and to build your resume. So don't, you know, dismiss this as a possibility just because of the atmosphere that we happen to be in. Another option is vocational or technical training. This training, while it takes place in the classroom, can have a lot of hands-on elements to it. Typically, these are shorter programs. You receive a certificate in like nine months to a year. So it's shorter training. So yes, you're in the classroom, but you're going to spend less time in the classroom and you're most likely going to have some hands-on. So say, for instance, you're training to be a mechanic, you're probably going to get your hands into a motor, into a car, and do some of your training through that. 
but each program is going to vary in what you do, but this is another type of training. And then, of course, there is what I guess we traditionally think of as training after high school, which is post-secondary education at a college or university. So, of course, this is you choose a major, you're pursuing that major, you take all the classes, um, get all your core classes, that kind of thing. You can also test out of some of your core classes and you can talk to your advisor and your guidance counselor about those kind of things. But so this is, yet, like I said, just the traditional, I'm pursuing this degree. You can go all the way through a, a doctorate, you know, and, and postgraduate work. So if you want to do a higher level career, um, or something specialized that requires um, education from a college or university, this would be the route, a, a route you could, you know, take. You can look at things like ONET online to look at jobs that may be of interest to you and find out what the majority of people in that field have as far as their training. Um, whether it's some high school or some college or, uh, you know, an advanced degree or if it's tech school. So that's ONET online. Um, and you can just look it up that way. And there's, um, you can search by, you know, the, the job title or the broad category. And there's also some interest inventories and tests on there that you guys um, can take at home to help you, you know, if you're looking through uh, those jobs and you're not really 100% sure. And then also, of course, talk to your vocational rehabilitation or blind services counselor about your interests and your vocational goals. In this slide, I will be discussing accommodations at the college level. One of the first things we advise our our clients and students is as soon as they are enrolled in the college or university is for them to begin working with the Office of Students with Disabilities within their college and university as soon as possible and to familiar, familiarize yourself with that section of the, of the campus. Secondly, make sure that you have, a, you have and keep written copies of your approved accommodations. Third, familiar, familiarize your professor with your accommodations and needs. We specify this because many times, especially entering as a freshman and in a lot of in a lot of these introductory courses, they tend to be large lecture halls with students that could easily go over 80, 100 students per lecture hall. It is important if you can build a report and familiarize yourself with your professor as far as what your accommodations and needs are. Many times when the professor hands out a syllabus, for instance, at the beginning of the semester, they will even indicate if you need or require a special accommodation um, that you can communicate that need to them either through office hours, before or after lectures, or in an email or phone number that they provide. Um, many times that is specified within the syllabus. If not, um, we always advise to build that report, familiarize yourself with all your professors so that they are aware of the accommodations and needs that you do have. The last bullet point discusses submitting requests for academic accommodations, which, which can include extra time, special testing conditions, and use of assistive technology. We outline these, just be mindful as well um, to take into account time when you make in, make when you are submitting these requests. If you know, and many times it is noted on a syllabus that you are going to have a test or an exam in the lecture hall on a specific date and time that requires any of these accommodations, for instance, make your professor well aware in advance so that they can provide that accommodation so that you're not giving them, you know, notice either a day or two before or right the day of the testing. Even if you have built that report with the professor and they are made aware of your um, academic needs and accommodations, just it's important always and to play it on the safe side just to remind them and give yourself that extra time that you may need. So planning is essence in this and planning um, helps a lot. Sheltered workshops. 
Shelter workshops are a post high school option, although not one that we promote. I do, we do feel that, you know, you should have the information about this option um, so that you have the ability to make an informed choice. It means you have the information to make your choice. So we want to talk to you a little bit about shelter workshops. And so what is it? What is a sheltered workshop? A sheltered workshop is a facility that employs individuals with disabilities separate from others. Most likely, these entities are going to pay sub-minimum wage, meaning that it's less than whatever the minimum wage is at that time. And so what are the concerns about working at a sheltered workshop? I mean, you know, it's sheltered. Shelter sounds like a good thing, right? So first of all, some minimum wage are paid to workers in these facilities. So they also have limited access to health care benefits. There's a large salary gap between workers and management. There's limited contact with those without disabilities and little to no opportunity to advance in these facilities. So I just want to share a little bit again by the numbers. Um, so sheltered workshops employ roughly around 321,131 individuals across the country. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, like I said, the subminimum wage and the salary gap between um, individuals with disabilities and the people who manage and run these facilities. One facility in Gainesville, and all of this uh, comes from one of the resources in the back of the presentation called Segregated Employment and, and Exploited, I highly recommend it as a read um, if you have the time to go through it. And also check out um, a, a film called Bottom Dollars, also very excellent, and it's one of the resources in the back here. But so back to the numbers. One facility in Gainesville um, was found to have listed in their certificate application to pay workers, this is the certificate that they need to pay that subminimum wage. Uh, they they were found to pay workers between one dollar and two dollars per hour. And then in other locations, other facilities around the country, there have been wages found as low as seven cents an hour. And um, in some workshops, you remember, there's some paying a dollar, two dollars, seven cents an hour. Some workshops, um, their CEOs make, um, you know, between 360000 to a million dollars a year. And the workshop itself, you know, sometimes make between $105 million to 205 million a year. So, you know, you've got companies bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars and then, you know, paying the workers the subminimum wages. So that's something to think about as you know, you're looking at this as an option. And then as far as healthcare is concerned, you know, because I said access to healthcare benefits are limited. One vocational rehabilitation study found that only 12% of sheltered workers had access to health care benefits. So that's not a large population that have access to health care benefits. Yes, you may have access to health care benefits through Medicare or Medicaid, and that is great. But as far as employer-paid health care benefits, not a lot of workers you know, have access to that um, benefit. The other thing that I want to highlight for a, a moment is the fact that um, these facilities do have limited contact with people without disabilities. So the people that you're in contact with most of the day 
have disabilities. You're not getting that opportunity like you did in high school to have contact with your non-disabled peers. A lot of times they're in faraway places, segregated from the community. And, you know, unfortunately, that can lead to some neglect or abuse um, within those facilities because you are you know, far away from the community. So those are all things to think about. We're not at all saying that every sheltered workshop is like this. And you know, if you're interested in a facility, we would encourage you to do your work, uh, your homework before deciding to sign up with that facility. But no, we are not making a blanket um, statement that all sheltered workshops are bad or committed abuse or anything like that. We're just saying that the possibility exists that this could happen because of the kind of environment that it is. And again, encourage you to do that homework um, and also encourage you to look at the resources and the finances that you have available before making um, this choice. And also know that because of um, regulations such as WIOA, in order to make this choice, you're going to first have to become a VR client and let them, um, you know, fully and thoroughly assess you to make sure that there is no other work that you can do so that you can get a certificate to take to one of these facilities to show that, you know, this is, that, that you know, you, you were not able to work in a competitive um, setting. So, those are some things to think about. Yes, it is available, but we encourage you to do your research before, you know, making making this choice. Is it possible my child can access competitive employment? Yes. Yes, your child can access competitive employment. Yes, you, the person with the disability, can access competitive employment. Accessing employment. You can access employment in a variety of different ways. You know, first of all, to choose um, what employment you want to do, one of the things that you can do is go through assessments of skills, interests, and aptitudes. A lot of these um, evaluations you can get through vocational rehabilitation. You may have already taken some interest inventories while you were in high school. Um, some of the interest inventories and different um, tests and assessments are paper and pencil. Some of them are observation based like the discovery evaluation, which is one that you can get from VR. It's um, a 24 hour evaluation, not that you do it all at once, but spread out, out over several weeks. They talk to a lot of people who are in your orbit, like teachers, parents, religious leaders, uh, friends, whomever you give them permission, you know, to talk to. They would observe you, take you places, see what things interest you, see what little hidden skills that you may have. Like one I heard about was a young man. They thought he could not do anything employment wise and they did a, a discovery evaluation. And this is going to sound really simple, y'all, but um, he, that he was observed to come in every day. And to make his own little frozen pizza, he took it out of the freezer, took it out of the box, all that, put it on the tray, put it in the oven, set the oven to the right thing, put it all up himself. And um, like I said, no one thought he had any skills, but there's a lot of employability skills in this one task that maybe we don't think about or we take for granted every day. And so they took that and he is now, he now works at a pizza place cutting pizzas and boxing pizzas and that kind of thing. So what they thought he could not do anything and he could do something, even, you know, even a simple thing, but it's, it's a lot when you thought you couldn't do anything and now you can have a pay job. So that's one um, to, to think about. Um, accommodations. 
we discussed accommodations before, but I want to discuss them again really quickly. These are some examples of accommodations that you could have. Um, and remember, an employer with over 15 employees, um, you know, is supposed to provide uh, accommodations if you request them. Um, and you can check out um, the Job Accommodation Network. Their website has, uh, you can look up your disability and common accommodations provided. You can also call them and talk to them about your situation and what accommodation um, you know you might need. They may can recommend some things, that kind of thing. Um, also, if you're having difficulty with your employer trying to get accommodations, you can also call Disability Rights Florida and we may be able to help you with that interactive process with your employer to get to the accommodation you need. Remember that the accommodation does not have to be the most expensive option, but rather it must meet your needs. So <clears throat> some examples are flexible schedules, simple devices, assistive technology. Um, Another employment option is supported employment. This is where basically you have a job coach there with you and they're with you more in the beginning and then they phase out over time. Um, so they might be there with you every day, all day in the beginning and over time, maybe it's two days a week and then one day a week and then maybe they just stop by every once in a while to see how you're doing. VR um, is going to end those services after a certain amount of time and then you know other services like APD agency for persons with disabilities may be able to come in and provide you with a job coach another option is customized employment this is where you and the employer kind of have a working relationship together where, like, for example, one young lady wanted to have a coffee shop, and this bookstore owner wanted a coffee shop, but neither one of them had the capital to either open a standalone business or to open this extra business, so they worked together, and the bookstore owner gave the person who wanted the coffee shop a little spot in their shop, and now you know, they're able to benefit each other because the person who won the coffee shop and couldn't afford all the overhead has now has the space and the bookstore owner has this coffee shop that's adding to their business because maybe somebody that wouldn't come in for a book would come in for a coffee but then see a book or a newspaper or a magazine they want and buy that and, and vice versa. So it can be a really good option to have, you know, a micro business or a small business. Um, do be aware that um, small business through vocational rehabilitation, you will need to do a small business plan and they do have people to assist you with creating that small business plan, but just know that it is a time intensive type of thing. That is not to discourage you, just to give you information so you will be informed about you know, what to expect from that process. And we can also give you more information about that process at Disability Rights Florida if you would like to give us a call to talk to us about it further. When you're in a traditional employment setting, another methodology, which we kind of already talked about a little bit, is reasonable accommodations. In general, an accommodation is any change to the work environment or in the way things are customarily done that enables a person with a disability to enjoy equal employment opportunity. Basically, you are changing the way a job is done. And that can even include things like for pieces of the job that aren't essential, meaning they, they don't have to be a part of this job. Like you can do all the things that need to be done on this job without doing that thing. So let's say, for instance, um, for whatever reason, you can't use a stapler. You can't line the stuff up in there, whatever. Okay, well, stapling may not be an essential part of a job. Um, so there may be someone else that you 
can take the pa papers too that need to be stapled and that person can staple or collate or whatever for you. So that's just one small example, but it's like a little change to the job or like I said, it can be a special chair maybe you need or um, maybe a, a keyboard or a monitor or something of that nature. And keep in mind that like 71% of accommodations cost $500 or less with 20% of those um, accommodations costing $0. So, I mean, accommodations do not have to be fancy. They do not have to be a Cadillac. You can have an accommodation truly that is as simple as a rubber band. A rubber band can be an accommodation. Let's say you need to remember which bottle is something and you can't see it. Like, Shampoo and conditioner will say. I know you're not going to have that on the job, but just you can translate this into that. But all right, so you need to know the difference. You wrap the rubber band around the conditioner, and so the one without the rubber band is the shampoo, or vice versa. If there's something on your desk and you need to be able to tell the difference, or you can use puff paint from Walmart to label things, um, you know, just a variety of different things in the way you do stuff or just modifying the way in which you do something so that is a reasonable accommodation and that can help you to take part in the workplace should i tell my employer that i have a disability if you think that you need a reasonable accommodation in order to participate in the application process or to perform the essential functions of the job, you should inform the employer that an accommodation will be needed. Employers are required to provide reasonable accommodations for qualified individuals with a disability of which they are aware. Meaning, you know, if you don't tell them that you have a disability, they're not necessarily responsible for giving you that accommodation. You have to ask for the accommodation and participate in um, the process where you engage your employer and it's an interactive process and you ask for your accommodation and they kind of come back to you and talk about other alternatives and things like that until you guys come to an agreement on an accommodation that fits your needs. Again, as we talked about earlier, accommodations do not have to be like the Cadillac or the most expensive accommodation, but rather the accommodation that meets your needs. Generally, it is the responsibility of the employee to inform the employer of the accommodation needed. However, you are not required to disclose your disability unless you need an accommodation. So again, if you want the accommodation, you have to ask for it. Even if the employer sort of suspects that you have a disability, it's not their responsibility to come to you and ask you if you need an accommodation, but rather it's your responsibility to go to them and ask for the accommodation. Am I entitled to the same salary as non-disabled employees? The answer is emphatically Yes, you are entitled to the same salary. An employer cannot make up the cost of providing a reasonable accommodation by lowering your salary or paying you less than other employees in similar positions. Now, granted, if <clears throat> your role is janitor, no, you do not have to make the same salary as the CEO, but you do have to make the same salary as other janitors. So they can't pay one janitor, I think it's eight oh five an hour, and then pay you, say, $5 an hour, or pay, you know, I mean, with exception. Like, if um, James, the janitor, has been there since dirt, he's been there like 40 years and working, 
He is most likely going to make more than you, but it's more because of the time that he has put in and the raises that he has potentially got over his time. You might start at minimum wage, but that is still um, acceptable. But still, they have to pay you the same amount as um, your non-disabled peers in the same position. Changes in the definition of supported employment. Uh, due to WIOA, there's been a few changes, but we kind of covered them earlier, so I'm just going to read over this slide and maybe give you a little commentary, but must be in a competitive integrated setting, meaning you must be in a position that, say, someone else could apply for, on like Indeed or Monster or whatever they're using, and it has to be with your non-disabled peers. A short-term arrangement in an integrated setting for an individual who is working towards competitive employment. <clears throat> so, you know, like an on-the-job training where you've been placed there and it's maybe not necessarily something that somebody else would apply for, um, but it's still in a setting with your non-disabled peers, um, but it may not be a full-on job like secretary that somebody would normally apply for but you know that you're maybe just trying out or something like that <clears throat> the standard supported employment services have been extended from 18 months to 24 months for an option to increase um with an option to increase the time frame so basically vr has to follow you for a you know a lot longer um to to make sure that you are stable um, on that job <clears throat> and so these are our references things that we use to create this um, uh, powerpoint presentation and things that we would encourage you to look at um, <clears throat> different reports from different government agencies, um, including the National Council on Disability, National Disability Rights Network. This is the segregated in employment um, that I told you about. Um, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, the Social Security Administration, the work incentives um, sections, Disability Rights Florida, Social Security and Ticket to Work program. We have um, a lot of resources on our website. Um, with different disability topics to check out. So please check those out. Um, and then uh, the next page is another page of references, uh, ticket to work information at chooseworksa.gov. Um, <clears throat> the Federal Transportation Administration, we use some information from there. The Florida Department of Transportation, Agency for Persons with Disabilities, the Florida Department of Education, technical assistance paper on high school graduation options and rooted in rights bottom dollars video and this is a video I told you about earlier that's related to sheltered workshops and the link uh, to the movie is right there for you to have an opportunity to watch that and I, like I said we really encourage you to have a peek at that as you're learning about your um, post high school um, <clears throat> We uh, want to encourage you, please, to fill out our 2021 public input planning survey um, because your input matters. It helps us to decide on what things we are going to work on over the coming year, things like our goals, our priorities, our objectives. Please tell us what is important to you, what areas you think we should have more emphasis on, um, those kind of things. So please visit the link between um, June 1st, 2020 and August 15th, 2020 to complete our public input planning survey. Your responses will help us plan our goals, priorities, and objectives for 2021. And you can find that at www.disabilityrightsflorida.org backslash survey. And this screen is, this is all of our contact information, Disability Rights Florida, 2473 Care Drive, Suite 200, Tallahassee, Florida, 32308. This is our main office. Um, our contact number is 800-342-0823. And our TDD line is 800-346-4000.
4127. And you can also check us out on the web at disabilityrightsflorida.org. If you have any concerns, questions, um, you need to talk about a complaint or something that's happened to you, please call our wonderful, wonderful intake department and speak to them about your problem. They will be able to assess it and see if it's something that we can look at for further consideration, like if it's an issue that we cover, and hopefully, you know, uh, get you to an advocate for further review. Um, or they may be able to give you information and resources for other agencies that are more appropriate. So again, please um, give our wonderful intake staff a call and talk to them, you know, about your disability specific issue. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and we hope that you learned a lot. Thanks.